my goal began, became to create those types of frameworks that help each individual figure those things out for themselves. So as a strategist, I'm not a coach. I don't tell people what to do based upon some specific type of system. I'm not a consultant. I don't come in as a subject matter expert. There are aspects of mentorship in what I do serving as an advisor, but as a strategist, I'm really a pathfinder. I'm really helping you find your path. And once you find your path, you can be authentic, you can be genuine, and couple that with resolve and determination in terms of solving someone's problem. And now you have a very powerful program and you own it. And that's what's so important to me, because as I was looking at why the small business owners weren't succeeding, as I hoped and prayed that they would, much of it had to do with some of the resourcefulness, the ability to be resourceful within that framework. Welcome to a special Veterans Day episode of the Onward Podcast. This is your host, Emily Harmon. A veteran myself, I wanted to publish an episode today highlighting a special veteran. And today I'm highlighting retired Air Force Colonel Russ Barnes. This is a a long episode, so I'm going to keep my introduction short and just highlight some of the things that we talk about and what you'll get out of this episode. Russ talks about his career with the Air Force and some of the challenges he faced and how he dealt with them. We also talk about authentic leadership and the importance of walking your own path. We talk about the challenges of being an entrepreneur and the basic skills needed to start a business. And towards the end of the episode, we talk about systemic injustice and how we as individuals can contribute to resolving issues that seem bigger than ourselves. Russ, welcome to the Onward Podcast. Oh, thank you, Emily. I'm just uh, pleased to be here and super excited about this. Yes, me too. So we met, I think it was in March and uh, March of 2020, right before COVID hit. And we were both at PodFest, and then we attended uh, Jenny Clark's GovCon conference. And then that's where I learned you were an esteemed published author, uh, written uh, several books and then chapters in uh, some other government contracting books. And I've just really enjoyed working with you. To me, you, you just demonstrate authenticity. In everything that you do, everything that we've worked together, we're in a mastermind together. You're in the onward movement. I've seen some of the posts that you've made on Facebook, uh, trying to help people understand. I've seen some of the, a lot of the stuff that you've written on LinkedIn about racism and what you think we need to do next. And I just really admire you. So I'm honored to have you on the Onward podcast. Well, thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And in, in learning about your history and and how you have come through, you know, in, in the different things that you experienced in Naval Academy and then through your career in, in post-military and post-government career are very inspirational to me as well. And I think that forms that sort of connection of understanding and communication. And then, of course, bringing the authenticity piece in where when you are open and honest, not only with others, but with yourself, you are willing to share that. I think that creates a very powerful way of moving forward. I do too. I think another thing that made me kind of like you though too is that you wrote part of your chapter which you talked about basketball. Yeah. <laughs> chapter in the right. book <laughs> about right. basketball. So we have that in common too. <laughs> We're going to have to play one-on-one thing. <laughs> yeah. When I use my basketball analogies, I know you'll get it. <laughs> yeah. I do get it. Are you a lefty or a righty? When you play lefty. Yeah. No, I'm left-handed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And that's, that's been my superpower in two ways. One is when people see that I'm left-handed, then they start trying to guard me. By then, I've taken advantage of them several times. <laughs> and when they, when they figure, oh, he's left-handed and they adjust to the left hand, I can go to my right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's what my dad taught me, too. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm uh, putting together some uh, secret tips for myself on how to play. I'll, I'll meet you. So you were, you were in the Air Force. You retired as an 06. Yes. You were a B-52 aviator. That's Tell right. us a little about your career and, and, you know, if you want along the way, like, what are the big adversities you faced in your career and how'd you handle them? So I got to the military through ROTC. Coming out of high school and trying to figure out 
how I was going to get to college was a challenge. I'm one of eight children. I'm the third. My two older brothers are five and six years older than I am. So they were already in college, uh, finishing up college. And my dad was a truck driver. So I knew he wasn't going to have money to be able to send me. And I had to figure out how am I going to get to college? How am I going to make this happen? And uh, I didn't get a basketball scholarship. I did get a track scholarship, but I didn't want to go to the school where that was offered. And so the, uh, our, I did well on the SATs and, the, our, and all the different services contacted me and said, hey, you can compete for our four-year scholarships. And, and I did that. I actually got all of them and I looked at the different scenarios and decided the Air Force was the best one for me. So that's how I got started. When I went to college and I started an ROTC program, it was very interesting that I didn't have a lot of military background, didn't know a lot about the military, but I excelled pretty rapidly. I ended up being the number one general, number one cadet in the general military course. You know, how that happened, I don't know. And then when I got into the professional officers course, I ended up being chosen or elected as the commander of the Arnold Air Society. And that put me as the number one professor POC, because I was the highest ranking POC uh, at that point. And I don't know whether there was something natural there or, or what, but that was kind of the kind of the start of it all. But one thing that happened while I was in ROTC, and I'm a very strong-minded person when I believe in, in certain things, and I had real difficulty with the cadre, the active duty members who were training us. I saw them do things that I thought were not in the best interest of the cadet corps, and so I rebelled against that to a certain degree. And they beat me up for it. <laughs> Physically, I mean, literally, mentally? Professionally. professionally. Yeah. Yeah, so what, professionally. what year was that when you went into college? I went in in 78 and I graduated in 1982. Okay. So what I decided to do was I said, I was, I was slated to go into computers. That was going to be my, my service indicator, service number. And I said, if I go into computers and I run into people who have this mindset of these active duty folks that I've met, I'm not going to last very long. I'm going to be kicked out pretty quickly. So I just made the decision at that time to go into navigation because I knew they were not going to give me a pilot slot. And at the time, no one wanted to go to nav school. So I said, if they see sending me to nav school as a punishment, they'll give it to me. It's like the... Ah. Patch, you know, <laughs> psychology on that. yeah. So that was this sort of dynamic that was going on. The there was an assistant professor of aerospace studies who, when I was the commander of the Arnold Air Society as a junior, I was responsible for putting on the military ball, and she would call me in her office every day to ask me what was going on, where was it, how was it progressing, what was going, what was going on, what was going on. I'd been in the Air Society, and I knew that that was not a standard practice, so I didn't know why she was doing that to me. But it was always an adversarial relationship between me and the cadre. There were two enlisted guys in the cadre who would tell me kind of behind the scenes what they were saying about me (laughs) and what they were thinking about me. So I kind of had an insight. So now when Jack comes into that dynamic, the professor of aerospace studies and we and Jack and I were friends, the professor of aerospace studies, I can only assume that he was going to punish anybody who was associated with me. When a pilot slot came down, he's going around asking, well, we have this pilot slot. Who should we give this pilot slot to? And the two enlisted guys in the cadre go, are you kidding me? Who's the only person who talks about being a pilot every single day? And he didn't give it to Jack. He gave it to somebody else. And I thought that that was, I didn't like that. I, I, I didn't think that that was professional. I didn't, I didn't think yeah. he was professional about the assessment of putting people into situations where they could excel. And it was personal. It wasn't professional. It just wasn't professional. And I, Let me I, ask you a question. So I, yeah. I, 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 I'm just wondering, were you the only black person in the unit? Do you think nope. you were? No, because so. no, Jack is black. You know, he's, mm-hmm. he's a black guy. He's, you know, Haitian. There were quite a few black people in in the core mm-hmm. at the time. Okay. So I always have a problem talking about racism. Yeah. You can't pin it down. I can't say that he didn't like me because I was a black person, but he did definitely treat me differently in certain areas. And I just maybe it was because I was 
a person who created friction. <laughs> <laughs> but he's the leader. He's training me and he's teaching me how to become an effective officer. And when I'm watching him and I'm losing respect for him because he's making decisions that are not, to me, professional-based decisions, I lost all respect for him. And, and I guess that's the bottom line. I told them when they were looking for group commanders. So I was one of the top cadets in the Corps, and then there was another guy. And it was between kind of the, between the two of us to become the, the uh, Corps commander for, this, for our senior year. And I told them, I said, hey, you know what? I've been the only society commander. If I'm not chosen to be group commander, uh, Corps commander, first semester senior year, I'm going to turn it down because I'm not going to do it second semester senior year. And I have my reasons for not wanting to do it second semester senior year. And um, when they didn't choose me, they chose the other guy. I said, okay. And when they came around the second semester and said, hey, we want you to be a core commander, I said, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't. And it probably cost me a regular commission or distinguished graduate or whatever else. But it was a standard, I think, that I'm having a difficult time explaining what it was all about. But I felt like I was being true to, I guess, my authenticity at the time. Yeah. I said, there's something going on here that is not right. And I'm not going to stand and be a victim to it. I'm going to go my own path. I'm going to walk my own path. And if that path has pain associated with it, or if it has challenges associated with it that I might not otherwise have to face, so be it. But I'm going to walk my own path. And, and I had, and again, so then I had to have that strategic mindset to say, how can I get what I want, knowing that they're going to prevent at every step they're going to try to prevent me at every step from getting to where I want to go. And you had to have confidence in yourself too, to do that. Because yeah. people might just be like, oh, you know, I'll take what I can get and I'll mm -hmm. take that job the second time around or whatever. Mm -hmm. so you had to yeah. have a lot of self-confidence to be able well, to Well, I knew some things. And one thing I knew was that the core, the detachment had been on probation for not graduating enough cadets and commissioning enough cadets. And they were on probation, off probation, on probation, off probation. And I knew that was his, I knew that that was his report card. And so if a cadet had good enough grades, there was no reason for the Corps not to commission them. So I said, I had that piece of knowledge, that piece of information. So I knew he wasn't going to kick me out. I knew he wasn't going to take away my scholarship or anything like that. So I felt that I was safe in that realm. And he actually threatened us. You know, he scared the lights out of Jack because he told him, we're going to kick you out of the core, and then you're going to have to go enlisted. <laughs> and so Jack and I had this conversation, and he was like, man, this is what he said. This is what he told me. This is what he said he's going to do to us. And I said, man, I said, don't worry about it. I said, he can't do that. I said, we have good grades. We are, if he doesn't commission us, he's going to have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> yeah. well, you had good situational awareness, too. Yes, yes. So, so I was like, don't worry about that. He's not going to do that. That's not a decision that he's going to make. So yes, understanding the dynamics, understanding where I was vulnerable, understanding where I had the potential to be a victim in the situation and really saying, I'm not going to. And then considering the options and the consequences as, as well. Because I said, okay, so suppose he does kick me out of the core. I will take that path and then I will make that path whatever it is I need to be. I guess I've always had this sense of at some point I am going to exit the current circumstances and the person who is in my path is going to be removed out of my path. And at that point, then I need to take my energies and move forward with whoever it is who is now in control of the decisions that affect my life and affect my career. So it was a matter for me, it was a matter of timing. And you also knew your values. Yes. Yeah, I was going to work hard. I knew I was going to do the best job that I could possibly do. And I knew that I was going to try to be the best in the situation that I could possibly be, whatever that turned out to be. Throughout my military career, I told my wife tons of times, it's time for me to get out. I got to go do something else. I don't think like them. They don't think like me. They promote me. <laughs> you were always kind of different, you felt, in the military. So that didn't stop there. And then, but you retired as an 06. Yeah. And that's what that to a certain degree. Well, what kept me in the, in the military was leadership and the opportunity to be in situations where I could in, develop and increase and improve my own leadership because I'm an introvert by nature. You know, Myers-Briggs, I'm an INTJ. 
And I studied the Myers-Briggs to understand what that meant. And what I learned was that introvert is not tied to reserved, quiet, shy, those things that are outcomes of being introspective. So as an introvert, I'm always in my head. And I used to hate it. I used to hate this always being in my head because it's socially, it makes you an outsider. So, and people will say, get out of your head. They would tell me that, get out of your head. Just be spontaneous. No. <laughs> You're also an N and that's the, uh, m- most military. And I'm, I know I'm generalizing our ISTJ. That's correct. You're and absolutely N, right. intuitive. Right. Because ISTJs are adaptive. That's why, because the military requires you to adapt right. to whatever situation and circumstances that you're in. And that's why I had a bit of a challenge. And that's why I was, had a difficulty in that is because as an INTJ, and it's, it makes me a strategic thinker. So I'm not adapting to the situations and circumstances as they are right here, right now. I'm projecting into the situations and circumstances that I think we need to be in. And how does that look? And what do we need to do today in order to get there? That's interesting. So when did you figure out you were an INTJ? And was that like a light bulb moment? Like, oh my gosh, that explains why I've had all these, some of these issues in my life. Yeah, it was when I was in Air War College. So I was pretty much towards the tail end of my career when in Air War College and they had us take the Myers-Briggs. And I saw that introvert. And of course, I just dug into it. I started learning as much as I could about it. As a matter of fact, I have a big book up there that talks about the, all of the 16 categories and what they mean and how they interact. And I just, I just studied this book because I wanted to understand it. And it was really a tremendous insight into myself. It did inform and determine my leadership style significantly from that point forward. So from the time I graduated from Air War College, I went to the Pentagon as the uh, political military officer on the J-5 and the Joint Staff. And then I went to European Command as Chief of Intel Plans and Requirements. I ended up being the Deputy Chief, but of Intel Plans and Requirements at European Command. And then I became the Policy Chief at Central Command. So I was now in positions where I could influence, and I wanted to influence not in the way that I had been influenced, but in a way that was going to be more productive and that was going to be more of a fit with my personality. So yeah, that was huge. And and I I actually became an assessment junkie after that. Yeah, you probably realize, wait, I'm not, I'm just a little bit of a fish out of water. That's why I'm different, you know, I'm different than a lot Mm -hmm. of people that I'm Mm -hmm. surrounded by. And I think- Exactly. And it doesn't mean that it's right or wrong. It's just I'm different. And now I understand a little more why. And this is where it does, this is where it comes to authenticity because- When I talk to people about leadership, I tell them, you need to lead from who you are. You have to lead from the internal. If you are a directive style leader and you don't have a problem telling people what to do and watching over their shoulder to make sure that they do it, then you need to be that because that's what people are going to expect from you as a leader and they're going to adapt to that. But if you try to be a warm, fuzzy, nurturing type of leader and that's not who you are, that disconnect is going to be so obvious and you will not get the, you know, number one, you won't get people who believe what you believe and there'll always be this. And when crisis situations hit, you're going to revert back to your natural style anyway. So you may have recruited a bunch of people or attracted a bunch of people who are wanting this nurturing style and all of a sudden you become the tyrant. Yeah, (laughs) that's exactly They can't be productive. No, and I kind of relate that a little bit to when I first took over as the director of the small business office for the Navy, the, my predecessor was just a different, he was a different person than me. He was like probably more outgoing, he was more outgoing than me. He was a joke teller. And so whenever he started his speeches, he would use a joke, but that wasn't me. So I couldn't do that. And that's something that they tell you, you know, if you're, if you're giving presentations, you don't just start with a joke just because that's what other people do. If you're not a joke teller, it's going to be clear that that is not you on the stage. Yes. <laughs> I tried that once. I tried to tell it when I was starting this, this training session and I still cringe when I think about it. <laughs> it was an awful joke. I, I didn't think of what joke I was going to tell before I got out there. So I had to decide to think of one on the spot and it wasn't the best one. <laughs> That's not you, right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a recent thing that I thought of within the past couple of weeks, and it's leadership 
from the perspective of people who lead organizations and people who lead people. And I, I recognized this differentiator because I was working with this person who was pushing, 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 and volunteering people and, and pushing people to take jobs that I felt that they weren't necessarily interested in taking. And I said, why is this person doing that? And then I started noticing that other people did that. And it occurred to me at that moment, I said, this person is leading the organization. They want the organization to succeed. And it's not so much the people in the organization as much as it is having the roles filled. So if I can just get anybody to fill a role, then we're good to go. But on the other hand, I didn't lead that way because I looked at and said, what is it that we're trying to accomplish as a group? And how can I best position people so that they can bring their best effort and then be creative in finding solutions? And so that was a delineator. And there's that book called Turn the Ship Around. You know, um, you may have read that. If not, it's, it's a great book. And when I read that book, I realized that many of the things that were discussed in the leadership perspective in that book are things that I came to during my career. And as an introvert and an INTJ, I was able to, to execute those things. But I had real problems. When you talk about overcoming adversity, I did have problems. I've always had problems with leadership because I don't think the way they think. And I really did have a problem with many of the senior leaders in the military because they want you to anticipate their needs and fill their needs and, and, and get things done before they have to ask you to get things done. And that was hard for me. I was always about, where are we going? Yeah, I want to make you look good. My job is to make your job easier. But for me to try to be you and be in your head, I can't do that. And that was one of the reasons why I said, you know, I, I never really thought I was going to be promoted because I, I never did that kind of thing. But what you were talking about, too, is uh, in that book, Good to Great, I think that's a book about getting the right people on the bus. And so yep. you as a leader are authentic, and that gives the people that are in your organization the permission to be authentic. And then mm -hmm. you're able to get the right people on the bus. You put them in the positions that are best for them or yep. what they want to do, where their strengths are, and you're not doing it based on a, an inauthentic person because you don't and you don't know them, right? That's exactly right. And I told my people in the policy division, when you show up to work, either you should, at the end of the day, say, I learned something that improved me as an officer and as a professional, or I made a significant contribution to what we're doing as a, as a division. And if you don't go home at the end of the day feeling either one of those things, then we need to have a conversation. Because you should not come to work and go home at the end of the day feeling like you wasted your time. That came from, I had 16 years on higher headquarters staff. So 11 was flying, 16 was higher headquarters. Nine of those 16 was in joint jobs. I was a joint service, joint staff officer uh, designation. And as I went from one higher headquarters job to another job, I recognized that it took a year for a staff officer to become comfortable in what they were supposed to be doing. And at that point, either they had a year left or maybe two years left, depending upon how, where they were in the assignment cycle. So when I took over as chief of the policy division and they hated it, all I ever heard on staff was, I can't wait till I get back to flying. Or I can't wait till I get back to ship. I can't wait till I get back to operations. And it was a grind. And I said, the staff shouldn't be a grind because we have important work that we're doing here. And if we're not being, bringing the best and creativeness of ourselves, then that's a problem. We need, to, we need to do something about that. And so I had my, my chance as the chief of the policy division to influence that and say, you're here because there are soldiers in the field, airmen, seamen in the field who need resources. And it's our job to make sure that they get them. Right. So when you come to work, don't come to work thinking you're just pushing a piece of paper and then you go home at the end of the day because there's, there's implications to these pieces of paper that we deal with. Have them see the big picture and their role in the, the big, big picture. picture. And then yes. you something about if they're not feeling productive or feeling like they're contributing or feeling like they learned something to come see you. But as a leader, too, you have to create that environment where they feel comfortable coming and talking to you about that. Too. They do. And what I would do is I would go to their desks. I would leave my office and I would walk down to their desk and I'd just stand there and just say, hey, how's things going? You know, what are you working on? You know, be approachable. Exactly. And, and just and just engage them in a conversation with with no ulterior motive. I'm not coming here to see if you're busy. I'm not coming here to make sure that you're working. I just came to, to have a quick conversation. And then that opened up 
the door so that they felt comfortable coming into my office then because they knew coming into my office didn't mean a beat down. Coming into my office didn't mean inquisition. Right. If they had an issue, if they had a problem, if they had a question, if they just had a thought about something, then they felt free to come in and, and, and have that conversation. And when you talk about open door policy, I did have that, which meant that sometimes at five o'clock when you know things were shutting down, I had a ton of email that I had to go through and process and, and, and get done. But I was okay with me. Right. I wanted them to be comfortable in, in coming in and having conversations. So you retired as an 06. And is that when you went and got your PhD? After you retired? Um, while you were in? When I retired, because of my experiences, I had one goal in mind, and that was to never work for anybody ever again. <laughs> I did not know how I was going to make that happen, but I tried a few different things. I looked at investments. I said, well, if I can become a, a stock investor and just buy and sell stocks, and I traded options, and, and I, that would have been my preferred, to just sit at my computer and just <laughs> trade stocks. <laughs> <laughs> and just make a ton of money in, in stock. That didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I took $10,000 and I said, okay, I'm going to invest this $10,000. And if I can turn it into $100,000 within a year, then this might be the path for me. Well, in, in a couple of months, it was zero. <laughs> 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 so uh, I, I decided to take a different path. And so then the path became to become an entrepreneur. And I said, well, this one is more uh, controllable. I can control the risk. And I can chart my path and I can be strategic about it, just as I always wanted to be when I was on active duty. And so that became my goal. How do I become an entrepreneur? Along the way, since I didn't know what my value was and I didn't know how to create a value proposition, I did take some courses, business to government course, figuring that I've been in the military, I'd been on staff, I knew people in Northrop Grumman and Raytheon, and maybe I could become a government contractor and, and, and serve in that area. Um, and when I finished taking that course, which cost me about $3,000, I realized that that was too risky for me to go into. So I got into the franchise because I wanted to be in business. I didn't want to just say I wanted to be in business and have a job. I said, I need to be in business. So the franchise was, was a good course. It was a leather restoration and bond and repair business. So when you talk about authenticity and vulnerability and uh, those sorts of things, I was fixing people's stuff. I was a technician by trade, but by mentality, I was a CEO. But that created a lot of disconnects because people are like, you're a retired colonel and you do what? You're a leather, what do you know about leather restoration and vinyl repair? How much money are you making? And, and it was just this cognitive dissonance that people just couldn't connect the dots. But I was being a CEO and I was learning and I was in business and I was around business owners. And I learned that business owners in a certain stage are really struggling with achieving profitability with their companies. And they lacked nothing. Intelligence, determination, drive, business model. They had all that, but yet they weren't generating the type of revenues that they wanted to generate when they first went down that path. And the, the term I use for it now is entrepreneurial poverty. Uh, they're in this state of entrepreneurial poverty and they can't escape. They don't know how to get out of it. And they're doing everything they can and everything they know to get out of it. So that was painful to me to see people in that situation. And it was painful to me because I was in that situation. A certain degree. Even though I was within a franchise model, I wasn't making the money that I had envisioned I would make when I started into that uh, franchise program. So I became obsessed with how to figure that out. So I took a couple of years to validate that it was a real problem. And once I realized that it was an extensive problem, a widespread problem, then I wanted to know, well, what can I do about it? I came up on the area of organizational development. And I thought that because of my, of my strategic mentality, because of my organizational uh, way of thinking, I thought that this would be a way that I could bring something to the small business community and help people frame their path so that they could be purposeful and intentional about what they were doing. And that would be my contribution. That's what drove me into the PhD program because I was having such a challenge. And the more I researched and the more information I found, the more I knew I needed to know and the more I knew I didn't know. So the PhD became the framework that I used to help me get into a community of people who understood organization development and could be part of my network and my group to help me understand how to apply this. Um, oh, that's awesome. And you wrote your thesis is like organization design for small business, the discovery of basic fundamentals for executing a purposeful path profitability. Yes. Yes. I created 
as I was doing my own research pre-PhD program, I found information on this guy named Jay Galbraith, and he had created something called the STAR model. And I thought the STAR model was a model that could be used for small business, but when I tried to apply it, it didn't work because corporation, it was written, it was developed and created for corporations and corporations have resources and they have people and they have money and they have all this stuff. Well, small business owner doesn't. So it wasn't directly applicable to the small business owner. So what I did is I modified it. I talked to a bunch of small business owners and said, what was it that contributed to your success that made you successful? And they told me, and I put that into the model. When I went into the PhD program, my goal was to prove that model and to create it as you know new knowledge, because that's what PhD programs are about, training you how to create new knowledge. So I said, I want to create new knowledge around this model. But what I found was it was still too complicated, even though it was simplistic, it was complicated. So I created a second model, and then I created a third model, and then I ended up at Basic Business Fundamentals. Because when we go back to our basketball roots, what are the basic things that you need to be able to do to play basketball? If you can't dribble, pass, and shoot, you can't play the game. So I said, okay, what are the equivalent to dribbling, passing, and shooting in the business world? And that became the focus of my research. And the three things that came out of my research were selling, cultivating relationships, and research. If you can't do those things in business, you're going to have a really difficult time building a successful business. And as in basketball, dribbling, passing, and shooting, those are just the basic things. Then you have advanced things you have to put on top of those. And so it's the same in business. You understand what it means for you as an individual to sell. Not what Sandler says, not what spin selling says, but you as an individual making a connection between your value and your product and a customer or client who has a need or a want. That's really the selling perspective and you have to figure that out for yourself. Yes, you have to be authentic about it because if you're not authentic about how you sell, I'm in a coaching course. We can, mm-hmm. I think too for military people, we've never sold anything. We don't mm-hmm. know you had said you didn't know your value. We've never I had never like priced, you know, I knew how much the military the, the Navy paid me, but is that really my value, you know, the value mm-hmm. that I bring to people when they work with me. So and if you're selling something in the what you believe you can deliver doesn't align with the price, then it's clear when you're trying to get somebody to invest with you. And then they're like, oh, there's some like gut feeling. Like, I don't really trust that person. They may not be able to pinpoint it, but it might be that she's saying to invest with me, it's, you know, a hundred thousand a year, but her actions are showing that she doesn't think she's worth more than a dollar a year. (laughs) Exactly. And pricing is one of the most challenging things that any business owner has to do, you know, veteran or non-veteran, figuring out how do I put a price on this value that makes sense, not just for me, but for them. So my goal became to create those types of frameworks that help each individual figure those things out for themselves. So as a strategist, I'm not a coach. I don't tell people what to do based upon some specific type of system. I'm not a consultant. I don't come in as a subject matter expert. There are aspects of mentorship in what I do serving as an advisor, but as a strategist, I'm really a pathfinder. I'm really helping you find your path. And once you find your path, you can be authentic. You can be genuine and couple that with resolve and determination in terms of solving someone's problem. And now you have a very powerful program and you own it. And that's what's so important to me, because as I was looking at why the small business owners weren't succeeding, as I hoped and prayed that they would, much of it had to do with some of the resourcefulness, the the ability to be resourceful within that framework and trying to use other people's programs and trying to use other people's uh, processes. When I create a system, I create that system because of who I am and it works. I pay thousands of dollars for other people's systems and they didn't work. If you are going to purchase someone else's system, that's a good thing. Just know that you have to incorporate it in your own way. That's good advice. I've learned that just recently because I'm developing my coaching program, right? And I have a couple different coaches and one of them's like, this is the way you do it. And the other one's like, okay, it's good to go with, this is the way you do it. But that coach is telling hundreds and thousands of people, this is the way you do it. And you have to make sure it's right for you. And so I took what he was saying and I get what he was saying, but then I tweaked it for me and it felt so much better. Yes. Yes. I would just live that, what you said. Yeah. yeah. 
So uh, the bottom line is that I absolutely love what I do. It's a fit. It's such a fit for me. Because you're not doing furniture, you're not doing reupholstery of furniture, leather furniture stuff anymore, right? So I sold, I, I, I sold that in, in 2012. I sold the territory in 2012, but I got so many tremendous lessons from there. Yeah. Uh, I told you the story about my wife coming to pick me up because I was working out there in the hot summer Florida heat and I got dehydrated. I was so determined to finish that job and she had to come pick me up from that job. I remember going in and quoting a price to a lady to fix her couch and she looked at me and said, well, if that's all you're charging, you must not know what you're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Coming to a point where I was so fed up with doing repairs because I had an employee. My goal when I went into the franchise was to learn enough that I could teach somebody else how to do it. And then I could be the CEO and they could be the technicians. And I would hire a team of technicians to do the work. And it didn't work out that way. I ended up being the technician and I had gotten so tired of doing repairs. I started um, raising my prices by like five and 10 times what I normally charge just because I didn't want to do the work and people would (laughs) say yes. And so that gave me a sense of putting my value on someone else's needs and someone else's wants. You know, there was obviously something about that repair that made it more attractive than just going out and buying a, a new piece of furniture. And it was like a family heirloom or yeah. you know, something. Yeah. Means something and, to them. and I wasn't going in trying to gouge anybody. I just didn't want to do the work. And I thought they would say no. And they said yes. <laughs> so, so that was a really big lesson for me when it came to pricing. And what it did was it said to me, if I price something at my value, I'm going to be happy with the price I put on it. If that price is higher than what someone else wants to pay, that's okay. Because they then have now assessed the price value match and determined that it wasn't a match for them. There will be those who will say, that's a price value match. And there will be them, some of those who say, that's all you're charging. So as long as I'm happy with the price that I put on my value, I'm very comfortable with, with saying it. So yeah. now you, the name of your customer, a company is Sistro Systems? Sistro Solutions. Solutions, sorry. Sistro Solutions. Solutions. And yeah. so tell us what you do there. It's business, it's strategy development and organization design. The whole premise is intentionality and purpose. And knowing every morning when you get up, that whatever it is you're about to do is going to move you forward down your path. So I do that, first of all, by using a very simple definition of strategy, which is how do you get from where you are to where you want to be? That gives us some very tangible things to look at. The first thing being, where do you want to be? And so many people have not even thought about it. They've not given it one second thought. So we talk a little bit about exit strategies and what those are. You know, are you going to build your company to sell? Are you going to build your company as a legacy? Why? What do you want to see? We talk about money because it's very important to understand that dynamic and that you're not in business if you're not generating revenue into your company. You're a philanthropist if you're giving away your value for free. And if other people are extracting value from you without giving you anything in return, then that's not a good dynamic either. So I define business as a value for value exchange. And you need to be uh, receiving some compensation for the benefit you deliver. That's being in business. So we talk about money. And and I ask, how much money do you want? How much money do you need? And we break that down. So then you know how much work you have to do to get that money. And then we map it out so that you can see how to get from where you are to where you want to be. And that's kind of how I help them get the benefit of strategy without having to become a strategist. Yeah. And do you do it with just government contractors or any, any company? I do it. Government contracting has come to, to me recently with Jenny Clark. Okay. Yep. <laughs> because I was just basically working with all small businesses. And my criteria was at the time when I started was uh, you had to be in business for at least two years. So it's not a hobby. It's something you believe in. And you had to have generated at least fifty thousand, thirty to fifty thousand dollars in annual revenue, and you're looking to become more profitable. You're looking to actually become profitable with your company because at that level you're generally not profitable. So those were my criteria. That was my my basic criteria going in. I met Jenny a long time ago. I don't even remember when I met Jenny, but two years ago she asked me to start helping her with GovCon, and that's what got me into the GovCon community to become more visible within that community. And so that's how I kind of got into that. 
That's awesome. And that's how we met. And now we're in like a little mastermind of yes. me and a couple other people. And we're, we're mm-hmm. writing our three chapters for a book that's going to be published soon. Yes. And yeah. Yes. So and I'm it, really it was- enjoying meeting with you once a week. I learned so much from you and that whole mastermind. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of being a leader too, is to surround yourself with people that push you, challenge you to the next yeah. step. Because one of my coaches would say, you talked about making sure every day you're doing something towards moving your company. And one of my coaches says, you know, he challenges us every week to do one thing, at least that gets you out of your comfort zone, because it's so easy to be like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm busy managing the schedule. I'll publish a podcast. I'll do this, all that. And then your day's all gone and you haven't left your comfort zone. You tend to migrate to do the tasks that are in your comfort zone that you know how to do. Exactly. That's exactly right. And so by having a map, you can prioritize and you can say, if I'm going to move forward, I need to do this. And if you procrastinate and you find that you're not doing it, you can then ask yourself, why am I not doing this? And that can now give you that impetus to get out of your comfort zone and take it on as a project. Because the other side of that is having somebody hold you accountable. I'm very harsh on that on myself. I try not to be that way on others, but I said, you know, if you go into business for for yourself, to have to have somebody hold you accountable, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. You know, your drive, your determination, your passion, whatever it is that you're doing out there should be enough to get you up and get you going. But I know that's not necessarily the case. But when I applied it to myself, I said, I don't want anyone to try to hold me accountable for the things I have to do. Again, I'm a friction kind of person, (laughs) but I want to push myself. I feel like I I need to push myself much more than anybody could push me. And if people start trying to push me personally, I'm concerned that they may be pushing me in the wrong direction. So again, that goes back to my belief that every individual is unique and every individual needs to take responsibility for their path. And I. That's why I prefer to be a strategist as opposed to a coach or a consultant, because as a strategist, I can co-create with you. The expert, I'm never going to know more about what you do than you will know. And if I try to describe to you what your problems are in a way that you don't agree with, it's only going to make you angry. But if I listen to your problems and I listen to where you want to go, and then together we figure out how to make those next steps, then it becomes a very creative exercise and it's fun and it's, it's positive and it's uplifting and it's all those things that I like. It's harmonizing and, and those are all the things I like. Well, I think, I think what you just described is, you know, you know yourself and you know how you work best mm-hmm. and other people might need to be in a group where they're kind of pushed and challenged. Yes. So the important thing is when you're looking for a coach or a strategist or whatever is find somebody that is that you resonate with and that you could work well with. And just to give like a tangible example of something recently that where I was not comfortable with something my coach was telling me, I I was not moving forward on something that I needed to do for my business. And I just kept procrastinating on it. And the reason I I figured it out, the reason I was procrastinating on is because I didn't want to, the coach had, you have to send a certain, you have to send an email this opportunity, this challenge, this little thing I'm starting starts in 10 days. And then you send another email, nine days, eight days, seven days. And I knew that I did not want to do that. I did not want to write the content for it. I hate emails. I hate getting emails like that. So that wasn't me. And so I did it a different way. And then I, I, but I still had to leave my comfort zone, but I had to figure out what is it that's holding me back? And that was it. I don't want to write those emails. Yes. (laughs) But I'm from the military and someone's telling me I have to do it. And I'm not like Russ who questions everything. So, you know, so then I figured it out and that got me moving. So it's yeah. much better. I did it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a situation when I was at the Pentagon and I was in real conflict with the one star and I was a Lieutenant Colonel. I was no five at the time. So a guy who was wanted to be my mentor. So he was kind of, he would call me in his office and he would talk to me and he was a full Colonel. And so he said, Russ, he said, you need to go into his office and you need to sit down. You need to tell him you'll do whatever it is that he asks you to do. <laughs> it's done. Oh, that's not you. <laughs> I said, and I said right there on the spot, I said, I'm not going to do that. And uh, the, my reasoning behind that was that puts me in a situation where he can tell me to do anything he wants me to do and then not have an outcome where I could succeed. He give me these impossible tasks and I could run off trying to do these impossible tasks and then I come back and and he says, Nope, that's not that's not 
right. And then I have to go back and do it again and go back and do it again and go back and do it again. And, and I felt like that would put me in a situation of being incredibly unproductive. And I felt that this individual would do that. You know, I, I felt that that's something that he would do. And so I said, no, I'm not going to set myself up for that, you know, like that. So we've covered your coaching. We've covered your military background. You've participated in the podcast episode I did where it was a recording of a Zoom call about racism yes. and, you, and social injustice. And you've educated me a lot on social injustice, giving me videos that I should watch, movies that I should watch, like 13th and, and several others. Uh, the, the movie about the Titans, the football team. It was like yes. I was living in Northern Virginia right at that time. I didn't really realize that stuff was going on, but, and then you've written some articles. What messages do you want to relay to the Onward podcast listeners about racism and how, and social injustice and what actions we as individuals can take? Sometimes it seems like it's just such a huge problem and um, challenge and what can I do? The message that I really want to convey is that we have a constitution that is the greatest document on the planet and it outlines an ideal and it outlines that an ideal that I was willing to fight for. And I think anybody who talks about the Constitution believes that to be true. My challenge has been that as a society in the U.S., we haven't lived up to those ideals, even from the inception, even from the very first day that that Constitution was signed. We were not living up to it in that moment. But the thought was that we would live up to it that we would strive to live up to it, that it was a guide that would help us to function as the greatest society in the world. But it hasn't been used that way. And where I believe personally, in my opinion, that we're going further away from it as opposed to closer to it. I would like for us to take a different perspective and maybe turn ship around. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the perspective that concerns me. When I hear people talk about the Constitution, they say, the Constitution guarantees me my rights. I have the right to free speech. I have the right to due process. I have the right to bear arms. And nobody's going to take those rights from me. And you know, immigrants are not going to be able to come in here and take those rights from me. And this ethnic group isn't going to be coming here and take those rights from me. And therefore, their protests are tantamount to anarchy, and I'm not going to stand for it. But when you read the Constitution, that's not what the Constitution says. The Constitution says we all have these rights. These rights are for all. When you look at the Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty says, bring me your tired, you know, your poor, your huddled masses. And we have to turn the ship around so people are starting to think. America is a place where people come to live their dreams. And Someone coming into this country to live their dreams or someone living in this country to have the full opportunity to live their dreams doesn't take away from me. It enhances me to a certain degree because now we're all better. And the competitive nature that we have can be a competitive nature of destruction or it can be a competitive nature of growth and development, sort of iron sharpens iron. And I think we need to change the mentality. I think that the laws that have been written with the intent of supporting the Constitution have been detrimental. Whether that was intentional or not intentional, we can't know because we can't get into the minds of the people who made those laws, but they haven't led to the society that I think we all want to be a part of. Now, we want to be a part of a society where division is not the issue, where race is not the issue, where gender is not the issue, where preference is not the issue. And maybe it's from the military, because in, in the military, we had national security as our guide. And yeah, we're flawed human beings, and we, we do things that hurt each other. But at the end of the day, in my experience, in my 27 years, I worked with so many people who were dedicated to making sure that we were successful in what we were doing, that that's my perspective. And bringing that perspective out of the military into the non-military community, again, puts me in the position of friction. It puts me in the position of being at odds. And I have a really difficult time not being angry at the conceptual expressions of people who are now saying, this is my constitution and you have no right to it. Well, this is my constitution and so it didn't serve you, get over it. No, I can't abide by that. <laughs> yeah. 
So take me back to the ROTC thing that we were talking about on my three ribbons and saying, I know what the rules say. If you're not going to do your homework and figure out that that's what they say, then don't beat me up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What can individuals do when this issue seems so much bigger than than any one individual? What can what can we do? What would you recommend we do to Um, help move social justice along in the right in, in the right direction? Awareness. Um, become aware. Several years ago, I recognized a trend that was occurring, and it was the media was presenting different perspectives depending upon what channel you watched. So if you watch Fox News, you get one perspective on what's happening in the world. If you watch CNN or MSNBC, you get another perspective on what's happening in the world. Well, there are certain people who can't stand watching Fox News, and there are certain people who can't stand watching MSNBC. So what happens is the MSNBCers are saying, this is the way the world looks, and they're right, and they feel like they've done their homework, and they've done their research, and they've heard from the experts, but they've only heard that perspective that fits them, whereas the, this other group is hearing perspectives that fit them. So now when you start trying to have conversations, both sides feel like they're functioning and operating and expressing themselves from what they saw on the news. I saw that on the news and therefore that was a film and that was real. And, and I said, man, so it's not about fake news. It's about real news, but it's about news being presented in a perspective. So we have to find, so what I would say to individuals is find a source that doesn't anger you to become aware of what the real issues are. And that's why I like the movies and the documentaries, because you can watch a documentary and not be angry at the Dems or be angry at the Libs or whatever it is that you use to to call that other group. And so when when you watch these movies that are documentaries and are based on history, you can then put your news channel in a perspective that maybe lets you understand how other people are seeing that same piece of news. I was talking to somebody who said, yeah, you know, I I watched this demonstration on one channel and they showed the people looting. And then I watched the same on on another news channel and they showed the police throwing gas and tear gas and hitting people with with billy clubs. And, And so it all depended upon what that journalist wanted to present to support the point that they wanted to make. So awareness, be, you know, find ways to become more aware of the bigger picture. And documentaries are a great way to do that. You know, and ask questions and, and I think also talk to people who have different perspectives. Yeah, that's definitely good. But you have to trust that they're being authentic and genuine. Yeah. Because I talk to some people and they all call me a socialist. And I'm like, I'm not a socialist. I, it's not even in my makeup but they've already packaged me. And so no matter what I say, they put it into that, into that frame. So you, you do have to talk to people, but you have to be open to listening to them. And so that's part of it. Yeah. And taking a look at yourself, because I think we all have these biases and take a look at yourself and say, am I saying that all Republicans are this way or all Black mm-hmm. people are this way or all white people are this way or all Democrats are this way? We're all individuals, and I don't know that you can just put us in groups like that. We can have different opinions. No, that is the biggest key right there, is when you find yourself saying all, and when you find yourself categorizing a group of people by some particular differentiator. So when, when I think about racism and I think about systemic racism, that's the frame that I put it into. So if someone says, I have no problem with Black people, you know, they're great, they're, they're wonderful, I just don't want them in my company, or I just don't want them coming to my house, or I just don't want them going to school with my kids. Now, you have taken a whole group of people of which there are some really, really great people and said, I don't care how great they are, I don't want them. And all, it's kind of an all statement. So. How do you change that? That's an answer that I I don't know. But my perspective on it is you just change it with the kids. Kids are like, I don't care what you are or who you are or how you are. If you're a good person and if you're a friend, I'm happy. (laughs) And and, and then they're they're, they're taught something different. Like, why are you hanging around with that kid? You can't, you can't, that's a bad kid or, you know, and then they're taught that they can't just hang around with everyone. 
that they have to be selective and they have to choose. And um, that's where you start to, to get some, some challenges in there. But awareness, I, I mean, so the only thing, I say this all the time, and you've seen me post this in plenty, plenty of places where I, I just find it impossible for me, maybe for my personality to change the hearts and minds of people. When they have their minds made up at a certain point, they're just going to defend and, and justify, and they're going to validate, and they're going to use whatever historical evidence they can find. And in some cases, it becomes um, just uh, confirmation bias. When I want to make it, I'm, I, can, I found all of this information that supports it. So that's a tough one. <laughs> yes. I'll put links to your LinkedIn articles that you've written uh, in the yeah. show notes. So anyone so, knows? So, so I do look for tangible things. I said, okay, what is logical? What can you look at and not dispute? You know, you can look at the issue of mass incarceration, understand where it came from, understand what it's doing, understand how people are profiting from it, and then make decisions about rewriting laws to change it, reallocating resources to change it. When people talk about defunding the police, they're talking about one side is talking about doing away with the police force. The other one is saying, let's take some of these funds and apply it to a more equitable situation. So let's bring in some mental health counselors. So instead of sending a police officer in, we'll send in a mental health person to handle that situation who doesn't have a gun. So awareness and understanding of what is actually being talked about is, is something that I sometimes find people haven't done their homework to understand what it actually means. And you can tell right away when somebody you know, says defund the police and they go, what are we supposed to do? Live without police? Done their homework. Right, haven't done their homework into the yeah. issue, and they don't know what that actually means. It's a bad term. It's really a bad phrase. So do your homework and be aware, and look at when you're doing your homework. Look at all different kinds of perspectives and news stories, and make sure. Yeah, because then the next step would be with with a raised awareness of the dynamics, and particularly from a logical perspective on how the system is creating division. You can then make choices that improve what we're doing. You can have conversations. Voting is critical and it's very important, but what is the vote all about? The vote is all about putting people in a position to represent you and to write laws and to change laws. The power is in the law that's being written. And one individual said, there are so many laws on the books right now that you probably can't walk down the street or drive to the corner in your car and not violate a law. So if officer wants to pull you over, they can certainly find something because there's so many laws on the books. So are these laws being created and written so that they are bettering society or are they just controlling us? You know, are they just protecting us from ourselves? That's a real huge problem that I have. I don't need to be protected from myself. <laughs> I don't need to write a law to protect me from myself. So the vote is to bring in the people we're going to represent the best sides of society and work to make sure that we're moving in that direction with the parameters and the boundaries that we're putting in place uh, for each other. And if they're not leading to that, then they need to be removed. Right. They, Hold them accountable to, for that. Hold them accountable. Yes. And on election day, right? Their yes. Responsibility. Yeah. So awareness will help you make better decisions in terms of us moving towards uh, the realization of the ideals that are written in the Constitution. Thank you for this interview. I've really enjoyed yes. talking with you. I've learned so much uh, <laughs> about you. We didn't have really a lot of time to, to, to really meet and talk at GovCon uh, yeah. back in March. So I've learned a lot more about you, respect you even more, and learned a lot about leadership. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I had a great time. And I always end up uh, talking a lot. <laughs> I mean, we, we covered so many different things, and I think that there are so many good nuggets in there and a, a lot of information that people can learn about being an authentic leader. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's so much more comfortable. You talk about getting out of your comfort zone, and you will be out of your comfort zone, but when you believe in what you're, what you're doing and you know that you're contributing to the benefit of, of other people around you, it's really good. So I encourage it for everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for listening to this special Veterans Day episode of the Onward podcast. Veterans Day honors all of those who have served our country in war or peace, dead or alive. Thank you to all of the veterans listening to this episode. I would like to offer a special thank you, remembrance to retired Army Colonel 
Bruce Wilhelm, father of my children and my former husband. As I record this episode, it's the 5th of November, and his funeral at Arlington is on the 9th of November. And we hold him in a special place in our hearts. 